as I mentioned, 4,298. Uh, so 131 of them uh, are research intensive universities. And all of the uh, universities represented in the direct entry scholarship program are uh, research universities. And they are designated as having very high research uh, intensity. So why is that important? Well, research at universities are uh, relatively uh, unique. You do find them in some other countries. They actually originated in uh, Germany, and the United States adopted this, uh, this German model. But uh, these universities are well known for the research going on in laboratories at the university, and then taking the results of that research and bring it into the classroom. So the courses that are taught at these universities are among the most uh, current and progressive based on the most current knowledge. Uh, and uh, this is how these kinds of universities have really grown in terms of their uh, reputations. So uh, they are among uh, the top universities actually uh, not only in the United States, but in the world. So many of them are in the, uh, the top uh, up to maybe 250 or 300 in the Shanghai rankings. But in the U.S., uh, they're mostly in the top 100 to top uh, 200 uh, schools. The, um, in the Omani program, there are 71, and all of these are in the top uh, 100 schools in the United States. So we're talking about 2% uh, of the universities in the United States and uh, applying to those universities. Uh, all of these universities, many of them, are very well known wherever you are in the world. So uh, I'm sure you've heard names like Harvard and Yale and MIT, Caltech, uh, Virginia Tech, I hope, <laughs> uh, Georgia Tech, and uh, many others. Uh, so uh, many of these are foremost in, in their fields, in the STEM uh, fields, in uh, the sciences, and technology, and engineering, and mathematics. And uh, as I said, they're among the most uh, progressive universities in the world. So to give you an idea as to as to uh, the resources available at uh, research universities, uh, Virginia Tech is where I am from. So we are among the uh, top 30 in terms of research money that uh, the university has, uh, uh, has acquires every year. And uh, what that means is about half a billion US dollars spent every year in research. And we are number 30. So imagine what the other schools are like, right? So a tremendous amount of money is going into uh, research. And uh, uh, many of the uh, major advances in these fields that I mentioned are happening at these schools. So uh, these schools are also selective schools to very selective schools. So in terms of uh, uh, acceptance rates, uh, they may range somewhere from around 5%, like a Harvard or an MIT. And then as you go uh, down the list in terms of uh, rankings, maybe about a 60% acceptance rate. So at these schools, grades are uh, going to be very important. Uh, so you're going to be asked to submit a transcript, and generally the transcript is going to cover uh, the secondary school education, which would be from around uh, grade 9 is what we'd be looking for up through grade 12. Uh, many of the schools also are going to require uh, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, or SAT, or they're going to require the ACT. And the range of scores for the SAT, depending again on the rank of the school, may be anywhere from 1,200 to about 1,600. Now, 
do, does anyone know what a perfect score on the SAT is? Perfect score is a 1600. So uh, at MIT, the uh, 75th percentile, their score is a 1575 SAT. So very, very selective school. Uh, down to schools that may be uh, still in that top uh, 71 that are accepting SATs of maybe 1,100 or so. So uh, the ACT equivalent is about uh, 24 up to 36, which is a perfect score on the ACT. Sometimes uh, subject tests are required depending on the majors that students want to go into. Uh, the English proficiency may vary somewhat, but at a minimum, uh, about an 80 on the TOEFL, up to about a 100 or more on the, on the TOEFL examination. Or on the IELTS, anywhere from a 6.5 to a 7.0 or sometimes more, depending on sometimes the, uh, the majors. So. Are numbers the only thing that these universities are, are looking for? And the answer to that's no. They're also looking for things like honors and awards that uh, students have, have uh, acquired over, over their secondary uh, school career uh, and activities outside of school, like uh, volunteering, uh, things like this. Um, so students are may be involved in lots of different kinds of activities. And there's only so much room you have on the application, right, to, uh, to put those activities down. So uh, you want to choose those activities which are most impactful, most meaningful in that student's, uh, in that student's life. And then uh, also to the, uh, uh, which are also uh, perhaps meaningful to the school to which they're applying. So, uh, as uh, Mr. Wong mentioned, uh, the applications in uh, these schools generally require an essay of some kind, sometimes a couple of es essays. So at Virginia Tech, we ask for uh, a couple of essays from students. So what are these essays supposed to do? It isn't about how well a student can write. Oftentimes, I'm asked, well, should uh, should somebody help the student in terms of helping them to make sure the grammar is right and everything on the, on the essay? Well, absolutely. <laughs> American students, uh, they're helped by uh, their parents and by others to make sure that the, the essays are, are well written grammatically. But we want to see the student's own thoughts in that essay. It's, that's very important. And generally, these essays are going to help universities to assess qualities that the students uh, have in terms of their leadership, uh, their service to others, their attitudes toward diversity, and uh, their, response of, uh, their response to adversity. And all of these are very important qualities in a university environment for any student going to uh, one of these universities. It's important that students uh, have the ability to uh, stand out in some way in their university professions. So what if a student has some bad scores? Is that, is that the end of the road for them? Should they even bother to apply? And uh, the answer to that is, um, the, a bad score or, or some bad grades are not necessarily the end of the road. So some universities will look at a student's progress over time. So they may look at, okay, they had a rough start in some mathematics earlier on in their academic career, but as they went through uh, grades 10, 11, 12, those grades uh, improved. Uh, now I will say though that there's limited tolerance for that kind of thing uh, for, for bad scores among those universities that we're talking about. Uh, most of them are, are quite uh, demanding in terms of, 
uh, their expectations, but there's going to be some tolerance for, uh, for students who've improved over time. Okay, so this is sort of like a YouTube. You know, you watch, you watch a little YouTube and then there's a little commercial. So this is the little Virginia Tech commercial. Maybe a beautiful campus here. So uh, can I apply for more than uni one university at a time? So sometimes. So of the universities on the, the list, there may be some of those universities that uh, will uh, require students to complete their own application, that university's own application. For us at Virginia Tech, that was the case until just last year we changed to uh, the coalition application. So the common application and the coalition application allow students to apply to multiple universities at one time. So when you go into that university and you click on apply, it takes you to the common application or it takes you to the coalition application. And when you're filling out that application, you're filling it out not only for one university, but it could be for many other universities if you want to apply to those universities. Remember that every university you apply to is going to be maybe $60, $70, or $100 or more. So you have to keep that in mind. But um, it is a, a great convenience compared to having to go through and fill out individual applications for every single university. Um, I mentioned the coalition application, which is what we use at Virginia Tech. And actually, I went through the, uh, the guide, and I see them now, actually. Can, I'm just going to grab one of these. the uh, overview of uh, undergraduate scholarships. And inside, there's a list of universities. So when I'm talking about the 71 universities, I'm talking about these. Uh, so I went through this list. And uh, about 34 of the 71 here uh, actually use the coalition application. So the coalition application is like the common application where you can apply to multiple universities at one time. So uh, on the coalition application, which is what we use, uh, that might be a very good uh, application to use if you're applying to a number of engineering-oriented schools or STEM-oriented schools. Uh, so for example, uh, in addition to our school, Caltech uses this examination and Duke and Georgia Tech and Stanford, Purdue, uh, Princeton, UPenn, and uh, Vanderbilt, and many others. So uh, you can actually hit a number of universities using just, just one application. Of course, the common application receives, uh, it achieves the same end, but you want to make sure the common application also covers these universities. So I mentioned, uh, you know, facilities and uh, the resources available to these universities. And this is one thing that, that uh, I think is, is definitely a goal of the Omani government here, is to send students to uh, well-resourced uh, universities. Uh, a lot of students ask about student life at these universities and they're very rich. So all of these universities will have many clubs, they'll have fraternities and sororities for students to get involved in. They'll have sporting events for students to attend. They will have, uh, in most cases, Olympic class uh, facilities uh, for sports, and a lot of the sports that uh, students will uh, be seeing are, some of, are the sports played at the highest level of collegiate uh, sports in the United States. So all of these schools are excellent schools and highly recommended. So application deadlines. So the range, there is a, a range. It starts at about uh, the end of November for the UC system. Uh, and, but most schools are going to be uh, to about January 1st to January 15th application date for their regular 
uh, applications, and the notification dates may be anywhere from early March to early April, depending on the university. Um, you'll see some different kinds of options for applying. Uh, one of them is uh, early action, and another is early decision. And these are, um, they will vary somewhat, they'll vary widely actually between those, between those universities. But generally, early action means that the student can apply earlier. They can apply, say, in November, and they're going to receive a decision within maybe one month, maybe six weeks of uh, the application. So it's a very fast turnaround on the application. Uh, and early action usually is non-binding. Now that means the student, uh, if they apply for early action and the university uh, uh, accepts them, then the university has somewhat of an expectation that the student is going to come, but the student is not necessarily legally required to come. Now, early decision is a little bit different. So early decision, same kind of time frame, same kind of uh, action, but if the student uh, applies and they're accepted, under early decision, they're expected to come and may be legally required to come. So the student is not going to apply to a lot of different schools for these, for these options. This is in the case where they have one school that they really want to go to. If that school rejects them, they can still apply to other schools by the uh, regular decision uh, deadlines, right? Okay. So, that is it for my presentation. And I don't know how much time we have for, for questions. Uh, I'm sure we can take some questions. Yes. Good evening. Uh, is, there an, uh, is there a different kind of SAT score based on the types of engineering or the types of courses or any guideline or any reference material available on that? Yeah, they can be, depending on the school. And, uh, you know, this is a little bit of, uh, uh, at some schools, you know, colleges have more say than the university administration on the scores that they want to see. So you may see some variation in SAT scores. Uh, at Virginia Tech, though, that's, it's even across the board. So we have certain expectations about SAT. We do have some, uh, uh, well, actually, I take that back. There is some variation. Uh, outside of engineering uh, for SAT. Now for international students, we do not require the SAT, but it is a score that, that is helpful for us to look at, especially for engineering. My, let me ask that question, uh, frame it again. Suppose uh, on the Virginia Tech, uh, the student applying for a computer science engineering, Yes. the SAT score would be say something around near to close to 1500, I'm uh, hypothetical. Uh, so, it will vary. So uh, between schools, you uh, may see anywhere from, uh, depending on the rank of the school in engineering, Virginia Tech and other schools, it may be anywhere from uh, maybe 1,200 up to, up to 1,500 or more. Uh, so the higher the rank of the school, the higher the SAT definitely. Okay. Now, uh, for us, what we're looking for for engineering is uh, definitely a higher math score. So we look for a minimum of around uh, 650 as a starting point for engineering on the math side. So my question was, is there a difference in the SAT score required for a computer science engineering and a, an architecture course or anything else in, in, your, in the Virginia Tech? And yes. how, do you, how do you differentiate? Is there any documentation, guideline, anything? No, available? you're not going to see the, the guidelines published uh, externally. But I would say that uh, there is a variation. Because remember, we don't require the SAT, right? Okay. So uh, for architecture, if a student submits the SAT, maybe the math score isn't as good as a 650, but the, the score is a good score. Then we can look at that as supporting the student's application but we don't require it. 
Now at other schools, they may require the SAT, and they may have some variation in what their expectations are. So, so, uh, this open. So Mr. Donald mentioned before, there are more than 4,000 universities and each one is different. And as he also added, that even in the university there are some colleges and they're also different. So the option is really depends on you. Where would you like to enter? And higher the, the higher the school rank, the, the higher the SAT score is going to be required. But it makes sense, right, that, that uh, if it's something that requires a lot of math, like it could be sciences like physics or hard sciences or it could be uh, engineering courses that they're looking for strong math skills, right? Yeah. And, Have any uh, questions? Sometimes the schools will, will consider uh, the Thank IELTS score so as a balance, you know, to the verbal, SAT verbal score. And one of the slides will mention about the UC system. What do you mean by that? Uh, the, UC, the UC, oh, I'm sorry. University of California. Okay, got it. Yes. So we're talking about Berkeley, UCLA, you know, UC Santa Barbara, UC San Diego. All of those are on the on the list. Okay. And my next question is about scholarship. Are scholarship offered? Yes. So scholarships uh, at the public universities, you may not find a lot of opportunities for scholarships. Now, the private universities uh, will have a little bit more latitude with respect to uh, scholarships. So on a scale, you're going to see more scholarships available and larger schools. The way that uh, people often ask this question, why is it that international students pay twice as much as American students for their education? Well, actually, that's not exactly the case. Remember that a public university in the United States serves the public of the state that they're located in. And the government of that state provides a subsidy to the university that goes toward the cost of education for the students of the state. Students outside the state, um, and I will tell you that in, with Virginia Tech, a student in West Virginia, a student in North Carolina, a student in New York is a foreigner. Out of state. Just like, just like a student from Oman, okay. for better or for worse. Okay. So all of those students are going to pay more in tuition. Okay. And so scholarships less at the public universities because those universities are serving the interests of the, of the students in that state as a priority. Okay, my third and last one is about the transfers to sophomore or junior year. I yes. mean, what are the requirements? Because um, my understanding is that um, requirements like SAT is not relevant in yeah. this case. Really, you know, it varies so much within those institutions. I would, I would hesitate to, to give you any generalities, okay? I can only tell you how we would treat a transfer. And uh, actually, uh, to be honest with you, it isn't the easiest process. You know, a transfer is generally considered someone who has, I think, I'm trying to remember the limit, it's like, uh, maybe 24 credits, something like this, uh, at a school outside, outside uh, the United States, say, or outside uh, Virginia. So those students uh, would apply just like any other student. We would make a decision on uh, the student's admissibility. And then, but a lot of students want to know, well, how many credits can I, can I transfer? And the answer to that question is, I can't tell you. It's because uh, we don't look at the students' transcripts for the transferability of, of uh, grades until after the student is admitted. Now, you might say, well, why is that? Well, it's because we admit 6,000 students. So for us to do that for 1,000 students is not very practical when the students may not even come, right? 
So that's the way that that's the way it works for us. But other schools, it's going to be different. And some schools are quite competitive with their transfer policies, more competitive than we are. Hi. Hi. I have a question about the employment. Yes. So the requirements, if we have an F1 visa. Well, Sarah? Well, uh, it depends on the university, but the main rule is that you can't work and study at the same time. So you're only allowed to work specific hours in the campus of the university. So as a student, international student, you can't be having any internship apart from where the university is going to send you. So it just depends on the university and what's their agreement. But because of the visa, and this is really related to the consular section, you can't have a job during your studies. Yes. Now, uh, a job, what is a job? Well, it has to be paid. But the internship as well, unless if it goes from the university itself. Yeah, because I'm familiar with the OPT system after you graduate, but mm -hmm. if you're during your college years, if you got an internship or something, it's CPT. So uh, as part of my knowledge, I know that if it's not, and correct me if I'm wrong, if it's not part of the university, from the university where you were studying, and they will send you to an internship, you can't have an external internship to the college. Yeah, that's correct. That would be uh, working uh, illegally. Okay. So, it, yes, civil mm -hmm. training, uh, and that would count against your your uh, OPT. Okay. Did you but just graduate from the United States? Yeah, I worked there for two years with the OPT, but yes. uh, I didn't get a chance to get an internship during my college years. Mm -hmm. So I want him to do that. It is possible to do it. Yes, okay. and we have, um, at, I know at our university and the other universities there, I'm sure they have the same, that there are opportunities. To you have the ad academic advisor can uh, guide you yeah, through this. Yeah, that's correct. Or actually it's the, in most cases here, probably be the career placement office. Yeah, would be very helpful with internships. But I can tell you that at all of these universities there, like Virginia Tech, we have employers come to our campus seeking students to fill jobs at their companies. And uh, there will be plenty of opportunities, especially if you're in the STEM areas. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. For the scholarship, you mean, or for universities? Well, uh, uh, basically, what we talked about earlier, it was specifically for Omanis. But what Mr. Donald said, they had, you have several scholarships, you said? Did you mention that a bit? Well, actually, at public universities, there are very few scholarships are yeah. going to be available. So yes. the, there is more, like you have uh, more scholarship in the private uh, universities. Mm -hmm. However, the public universities are cheaper. Yeah. But at any of those university websites, you can go through these. these are, this is also, you know, if you want to know what the top universities are, just pick, pick this up and look through it. And most of them are here. So uh, you can go to those universities and just type in uh, international scholarships and the, a list will come up. So you'll see what the universities have available. Also, if you go through educationusa.gov, uh, you can find some of uh, scholarships. And it's for all the international students, not for someone specifically. You can find some opportunities there. Yeah. And of course, if you need any information about undergrad or grad, you're always welcome to visit us uh, at Education USA office. We are based at the U.S. Embassy, Muscat, in uh, the Embassy Street. 